joined DAA in January 2013 from Glanbia, where he was CEO and President of Glanbia USA and Global Nutritionals from 2005 to 2012. Before joining Glanbia, he held a number of senior management positions with Coca-Cola in Russia and with Grand Met in Ireland and Central Europe. He's a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Management Accountants and holds a diploma in Applied Finance from the Irish Management Institute. He's also a director of ACI Europe and the Irish business group IBEC and a non-executive director and member of the board of Total Produce. So Kevin is going to outline to us today his strategic vision for the future for both his own company and indeed putting it in a wider context. Perspective for me four years into the job of aviation in Ireland and how it matters and what difference it makes. Thirdly, just give you my take on the challenges we see as a business today, good and bad, like any business. Then I'll move through Dublin Airport in a bit of detail, what we're doing to drive and develop the business. And then I'll move on to the new Northern Runway project and take you through that and why it's so crucially important to the country as well as our business. Firstly, the DEA, uh, we're owned by the government, obviously. We're what they call a commercial semi-state, which means we have to uh, make our own investments, we have to find our own money, and the company is run entirely as a commercial entity. Has been since 1999, when we first started paying rates. Walking through the different bits of the group, we have four or five businesses within it. Our newest business is DAA International, which operates internationally in airport management contracts. We won a major contract last year in Saudi Arabia to operate the new terminal in Riyadh on behalf of the Saudi government. And to put that into context, it's about half the size of Dublin Airport, which has started up and is operating very, very successfully over the last six months. Our second business is ARI, which is the old Air Inter International, which is duty free. It's across around 15 countries at the moment and has been winning new business around the world over the last number of years with new shops due to open over the next 24 months in Muscat in Oman, Abu Dhabi in the new state-of-the-art terminal and in Jakarta in Indonesia. Our next business is Cork Airport, which is the second largest airport on the island with uh, over 2 million passengers and was the second fastest growing behind Dublin Airport last year, up 8%. We've got really strong growth momentum, particularly as the economy picks up, and we've driven a lot more inbound tourism to Cork and the south of Ireland, and we've a very exciting this year with uh, direct and indirect connectivity to North America with both WOW through Iceland and Norwegian now that we've won a long-standing battle to get a license uh, to fly directly from Cork to North America. Obviously Dublin, I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, overall, the group is about 2 billion of assets overall, about 6,000 people, 3,000 in Ireland, 3,000 abroad, primarily in our retail businesses across the world. We made a little over 206 million of EBITDA last year, and our return on capital employed is about 7%. Uh, we're regulated, I see Adrian here today is from our <coughs> regulator, and I'd have to say we're one of the heaviest regulated airports in Europe, along with Heathrow. Uh, but that is what it is, and uh, I complain about it a lot, but it doesn't get me very far. Uh, moving for a moment just to the aviation sector, I think it's a terrific sector. We obviously live in an island, but we have a far higher propensity to travel than our neighbours in the UK and in Europe. We travel four times more by air than Europeans, twice as much as people living in the UK. But aviation matters in this economy. Not only is it a key industry all on its own. We're absolutely privileged to have a number of very, very strong airlines based here, particularly Ryanair and Aer Lingus, but also a key home to the aircraft leasing industry, a key home for talent for aviation globally. And I think the government has recognised that and also recognised the very special role, quite uniquely, of governments across Europe that aviation has in creating economic impact and developing the economy. So it developed a very progressive national aviation policy a number of years ago, in which enshrined Dublin's role in providing essential infrastructure, which is one of our key challenges, as well as running the company successfully financially, bringing on the new runway on a timely basis and building Dublin as a hub to North America. As we stand back at the beginning of 2017 and look at our business and look at the environment we operate in, it's worth just summing up the sort of four or five key challenges, good and bad, that we see. 
Clearly, the Irish economy has been a great star over the last year in particular. It looks very strong again this year. I think we would see some concerns in terms of rising costs, competitiveness, also some of the fragility given the political system, not just here but across Europe and the US. Secondly, the oil price has been very good to our customers and therefore to us over the last two years. It's now started to go back up again, up around $56, which is good because our customers have made more money, they've bought more planes, they've uh, reduced their prices and it's helped our business to grow and develop. Thirdly is terrorism. Uh, the terrible uh, terrorist attacks, particularly across Europe over the last 18 months, have had an impact. Uh, I think if you look at the tourism industry in Egypt, Turkey, North Africa, it's been decimated. Airports are both a target, as we saw terribly over the last year, in both Istanbul and in <laughs> Brussels. And also there's a bigger issue, which is it actually uh, reduces underlying inclination to travel. If you looked in Paris last summer, there was a big step back in long-haul business coming from Asia. They just went somewhere else. They felt it was safer. So I think that's a big key negative factor at play at the moment. Fourthly, the airline cycle, it's a cyclical business. They've been doing well for the last couple of years, and when that turns and what it means is a factor we have to consider. And lastly, Brexit, which we think is uh, very, very negative. Uh, as a small island nation parked on the edge of Europe, I think it's critically important that we stay open, we stay able to trade with everyone, and we stay able to keep the advantages that we have at the moment. We'd be quite concerned where things are and how it's actually all going to pan out. There's now a very modern uh, leading Category 1 European airport. Last year we did nearly 28 million passengers. We grew by 11%. That made us the fastest growing major airport in Europe last year and we were the second fastest in the two previous years. We're now up to number 12, I think, in the airports within uh, mainland Europe just behind uh, Copenhagen, and we passed out Zurich in the course of the year. We enjoy, as many of you would know, the single busiest city pair route in Europe in Dublin, London. Clearly, Brexit will be a question for us there, how that continues. And we have a very privileged position of being the number five gateway to North America, which we've been working very hard with all our customers to establish over the last number of years. We have a very deep route network, particularly into the UK provincial cities and right into Europe, particularly benefiting from Ryanair being based here and their very, very extensive route network. We work very hard on our primary customers who are the airlines. And last year, we were proud to be the number one in airports of our size, over 25 million winner of the Roots Award, which is the best airport in the customer's opinion. We also work very hard on our passengers. And for the last eight quarters, we've been in the top five on the hard uh, metrics measured right across all airports across Europe. If you went back five or six years, we would have been in the bottom five of the top 30 airports. And we've been paying a lot of attention, particularly to developing Dublin as a gateway and our long haul route network. 20 years ago, we had four long haul routes. Last summer, we had 20. All that growth is uh, very good, very welcome. In the recession, we went down to 18 and a half million passengers. We're now back up to 28. But like any growth company, that produces lots of pain. Some of the key pieces of pain for us is how we develop our infrastructure to cope with that growth. We think of the business as a factory, so we look at each part of that factory, each part of the day, try to bring on enough capacity to meet our customers' needs on a timely basis. We've quietly been expanding the infrastructure over the last number of years, essentially rebuilding Terminal 1 uh, very carefully. If you think from the car park through security, expanding security, the shops just before Christmas, the new arrivals area, and we're also working through this year the actual departures area. So Terminal 1 will feel and look like a brand new terminal by the time we're finished later this year. And there's a reason for that, to be able to persuade our customers and passengers to be very, very happy in using it. Terminal 2, we've also been adding capacity on the car park side, on the security side, and particularly over the last 12 months, our key constraints have been airside. We've been bringing on more stands, places to park airplanes, and you'll see more of that happening this year. And you'll also see more remote piers, you'll see more busing, and you'll see some expansions on the actual airside. But of course, the big challenge we're facing is now on the runway side where we actually communicated last April that we're moving forward with our new, our third runway, our northern parallel runway. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. I suppose maybe just standing back for a moment and saying why, what's the need and why now? 
The need is because our core role and the key reason we're on the planet is actually to provide the essential infrastructure to let this country operate and to help support and develop the economy. Whether that's for tourism, which is a prime industry, whether it's foreign direct investment that we have so much of and value so much, whether it's for Irish trade that is increasingly going international, that's our core purpose, to actually help support that and drive it and make this a better economy. If you look at the actual scale of the numbers, we did an economic impact study about 18 months ago, and there's about 100,000 jobs directly associated with Dublin Airport, of which about 15,000 are directly on our campus. That's about 7 billion of GDP, which is about 4% of the national GDP. As we bring on the new runway, that will create about 1,200 jobs through the life of the project. There'll be about 7,000 jobs by the mid-2020s when we're up and fully running, and there'll be about 31,000 jobs when we're complete at full capacity a long time down the road in the future. The issue of why now is uh, a runway is a primary piece of infrastructure. You can't bring on a piece of a runway like you can bring on other pieces of infrastructure. And we're essentially full for a number of key times during the day. We're about 87% capacity in total between 5 in the morning and midnight next summer in 17 and we're going to be absolutely full for departures in some key hours and arrival in other hours. So I think that's the reason it's so important and why we've actually got to move now and as quickly as possible. Dublin Airport and the runway system we have and the infrastructure we have is a great example of really truly strategic long-term planning in this country. It was opened originally in 1940. If you look back at the maps at that time, you can see the runway and the airside uh, maps show pretty much what we have today. In the late 1960s, and in fact in my office I have a map on the wall from 1968 which shows the runways we have today and sketched onto it where the new Northern Parallel runway will be. At that time, uh, my predecessors took active steps to actually procure land, assemble a land bank, and the planners both in North County Dublin, Fingal's predecessors, and nationally, put in place a set of uh, planning guidelines and a framework to preserve the area around North County Dublin, even to the point of putting the southern runway in place first of the extensions in 1989, which essentially put a firewall with the city and putting in place sort of the green areas either side, west and east of the airport. I think that's uh, been a huge success factor and one of the reasons that we've been able to develop and are able to continue developing so quickly. I think it's interesting if you look at Heathrow, for example, where they're going to have to knock villages, they're going to have to knock suburbs to build the runway. Our new runway will all be built on our own land bank. If you look at the relative impact in terms of on the population, the number of houses impacted by, say, a key uh, daytime metric. In Heathrow, there are 46,000 odd houses impacted. In Dublin Airport, 250. I suppose the unfortunate corollary of that is that for people living locally, they say we live in a wonderful green zone so near the city, and they do, but that green zone so near the city has been put in place and kept that way, waiting for the development of Dublin Airport to be able to provide the economy with the infrastructure it needs. We went through the planning process in the 2000s. Planning was granted in 2007 with 31 conditions. I'll come on to some of those in a few moments. And the project, unfortunately, was put on hold through the recession when our passenger numbers crashed and there was neither the need nor did the company have the financial capacity to bring the project forward. I suppose looking across at what we're doing and how we're doing it, it's going to be a 3.1 kilometre runway. It's about a mile north of the existing runway. It's longer than the existing runway because we've got to make sure that Ireland is able to connect further to the rest of the world, particularly important if you think of what's happening, not just Brexit, but if you think of it in America and the way that a lot of parts of the world are becoming more independent and isolated. We've designed it to make sure it reflects uh, and is able to support the needs of our customers. And if you look at our customers and their business model, there are three key needs. We've got short-haul customers, and we have around 74 planes that are based in Dublin Airport. We benefit from Ryanair, Aer Lingus, Aer Lingus Regional, Norwegian, and CityJet having base planes in the main. And the key thing in the short haul business is you're able to get up first thing in the morning, get your plane out, get plenty of turns during the day and get home at night. Secondly, on the long haul, 
We are a small piece of a global system. We've been very successful, not just in building business to North America, but also building business uh, from the Middle East. And what's critically important is that we're able to fit into the flight patterns coming from those parts of the world, where essentially flights arrive in the main early in the morning through to late morning and leave late morning to mid-afternoon to be able to connect with connecting waves elsewhere, be that in the Middle East or in North America. And then thirdly, on the transfer side, we've been building Dublin not just as a gateway and one of the largest points of embarkation to North America, but very much as a connection point to parts of Europe and into the UK. And one in five of our passengers last year were actually not coming to or from Dublin, but to somewhere else. And that's really important for our business and making it more resilient to be able to cope with downturns in the Irish economy. Also make sure that our long haul route network, if you think one in five of those passengers are going somewhere else, it means there's a, a stronger chance of Dublin having a long haul route and our airline customers having better economics. Cost of the runway is anticipated to be around 320 million. That compares with a cost, say for example, in Heathrow of around 8 billion, and is extraordinary value for money if you look at what we get and what they'll get, which is on the runway side. There's lots of other different pieces of the equation, but like for like, we're uh, massively cheaper. If you look at our position today, there's absolutely no restrictions on our business, and nor should there be. We have two conditions that are hugely problematic in the planning uh, that we got in 2007, and we intend to look to have those conditions removed, one of which relates to uh, use of the new runway at night, between 11 at night and 7 in the morning. As I said earlier, we're actually totally full at a number of key times, including first thing in the morning. It's like putting an extra lane on the M50 because you're congested and saying you can't use it until after rush hour. So we think that actually is plainly uh, wrong and needs to be changed. The second is a constraint on nighttime flying on the total airport, not just on the new runway, which constrains the number of flights to 65 from 11 at night until 7 in the morning. Right now, we have about 100 flights at night through that time period. And that's been one of the key factors that's let us develop Dublin Airport so well over the last number of years, is building the long haul business, which tends to come in early in the morning uh, through to mid-morning. You might ask what's the impact if we didn't deal with those, it would be uh, horrific. Uh, firstly, the day we opened the runway, we would lose about 3 million passengers. So that clearly would not make any sense. Uh, by the time we get to 2037, we'd have lost around 6 or 7 million passengers a year. So a total of 80 million passengers would be lost to this island. And clearly, that would also have the impact of pushing up the, the price to our customers and probably pushing up uh, higher fares and reducing the connectivity that we'd be able to provide, which I think would be a huge disaster if you think we're moving into a time when the world is getting smaller, we need to be more independent, we need to forge strong trade, business, tourism links with other parts, and being constrained in that way essentially constrains the entire economy. So we think that doesn't, uh, is not a good thing. Moving through to how we've been working through this, I think there's a general agreement on the need for a new runway. We announced that we're moving forward with the project last April. Clearly, there's a huge impact on people living nearby, particularly those people that live nearest to where the new runway is actually going to be. And so we've been working very closely with them and all of the stakeholders, both formally and informally, in terms of engaging, consultation, and a process of formal uh, consultation as we have gone through the last eight months. I suppose the, uh, on the individual side, we have been working through the preconditions that we got in 2007. We put in place a voluntary house buyout scheme. There are no compulsory purchase orders. We've tried to construct it in a way that gives people as much choice and as much flexibility of deciding what works for them in the future after the new runway is opened. We've established that we're putting in place a house insulation scheme, community gains. We're also looking and taking input from our key stakeholders locally on other issues that they face and working our way through uh, the analysis of those issues and what, if any, mitigation we can put in place with an idea of putting in an EIS over the course of the next number of months so that we can actually go to uh, change those conditions. <coughs> There's a new uh, directive from Europe, Section 598, which looks at noise, which is what the two conditions relate to. It basically says, in simple terms, that four things need to be considered. One, land use, 
and planning. Secondly, the type of aircraft that you have in an airport. Thirdly, the amount of noise and the mitigation. And then determine is there a noise issue or not, and only then determine if any restriction is warranted. We believe, going through those factors, that there's not. We think we're very, very uh, proactive land use and planning, and it's been put in place a long time before me. Uh, on the aircraft noise type, 95% of the planes using Dublin Airport are of the quietest type. We have a variety of uh, procedures in place with both the airlines and the air traffic control people in terms of minimising the amount of noise, how planes approach, how they come into land, how they break, how they start up their engines, how they take off, how they leave flight paths to actually look on an overall basis how we minimise the impact on people living nearby. We also, as described earlier, have a range of mitigations where there is noise, and clearly there is if you're near the end of a runway, that it actually mitigates and reduces that noise. And we think we have a very, very uh, strong case in that, and we'll be making that strong case. And my job is to provide essential infrastructure, it's to run the business, it's to make that case. It's not up to me to actually decide in that case. So really, uh, we'll be making a very clear, firm case for those conditions to be removed. Where are we now? We announced the project last April. We started through the process of uh, complying with the various planning preconditions. We have continued on with the detailed work of design. We've been out through engagements with our neighbours and various stakeholders. We've had a round of uh, two rounds of public consultation. And we've started now the uh, clearing works on the site with a view to being able to move as quickly as possible. We'll be submitting the EIS in the course of the next number of months, as well as what we want in terms of the noise. It'll also be addressing other issues that have came up in the course of the consultation. So just to sum up and turn over for questions, I suppose there are three key things. One, it's a key artery into the country. It's getting clogged and we need to make sure it's able to actually work properly to support the development of Ireland, North and South. Secondly, we've got to bring on capacity that actually does that, not just build a 3.1 kilometre piece of concrete. And thirdly, we've put Dublin Airport in a position of having a lot of positive momentum and a lot of opportunities. And it's absolutely critical at a time when a lot of the factors in the external world are quite negative that we don't actually misstep or lose any of those opportunities. So thank you for coming and thank you for listening.